we're going to begin with Надеюсь, что я успела вовремя. Да, да, все, все, все хорошо, Мы проверяем звук, все отлично. Да, все супер. Угу. Раз, два, три. Hello, Екатерина. Hi, Ruth, how are you doing? I'm very well, how are you? I'm great. I'm sort of looking at the screen and I know it means that it doesn't look like I'm looking at you, but I am. I'm <laughs> yes. Um, How are you? Yeah. Well, I'm fine. Good. I, I just uh, thought, um, okay, I will tell later when, um, when we have a discussion because uh, I've been reading a new book. I will tell a little bit about it. Oh, good. Yes. Um, where is uh, the event? It's at Pushkin House, right? We're, yes, we're in Pushkin House. Mm. There's a nice crowd. You can't see everybody, I think, on the screen, but um, feedback as well. Okay. <coughs> so, um, thank you so much for Yep, no, it, it will be all good. So it's a very complicated technical setup, as you can see, because we, uh, we are here and um, you hear us in the speakers and Ekaterina hears us also, but also we live stream everything. And, and yeah, that's why, that's why it, it has taken us a lot of effort to set it up so everybody hears and sees everybody. So um, thank you for coming and um, you know, we announced this event um, like two weeks ago uh, and I was a little bit worried, you know, how good we are, you know, within our networks and how many people we'll manage to bring into the room. So, um, you know, we are quite cool. Um, thank you for deciding to spend our uh, your, your um, Friday night with us. Um, so I'm Denis Stolyarov. I'm an assistant curator here at Pushkin House. So, of course, we have Ruth McLennan, the artist whose film I hope you've already watched, or if you haven't, you'll have a chance to watch it after the event. Um, and Ruth is the reason why we are all here. Uh, but also, we have two other speakers, and Ekaterina Sharova is joining us from uh, Oslo, is it? Um, and yes. um, um, Ekaterina is the founder, is a co-founder uh, of the Arctic Art Institute, uh, an organization, an amatic organization, uh, which commissioned the film. So I, I hope we'll have a chance to uh, speak about, you know, the whole history of how this happened. Um, 
Uh, and obviously we have Charles Emerson here, and I have here um, a copy of his wonderful book. Uh, it's been published over 10 years ago, so uh, it's, you know, it's almost out of print. We managed to get, I think, two last copies from the distributors, so I hope that at the end of this evening we won't have these two copies, because it is a great book, and um, uh, we'll also talk about that. Uh, but um, Charles is... Um, uh, in general, a major specialist on geopolitics and history and European history. So this book uh, um, is something... Um, okay, I'll ask this question later uh, because, um, yeah, I, I, I'm interested why, you know, why aren't you continuing producing books about Arctic, the Arctic? Um, anyway, um, so... We are ready to begin. I have a set of questions, um, and you know we'll have uh, we'll we'll I'll stick you know maybe for 45 minutes to ourselves, uh, but then obviously we'll open up uh, for the questions from you. And um, the only thing that I will mention is that uh, um, people online and Ekaterina won't hear you if you do not speak into the microphone. So I will be handing that around um, so that everybody is. You know, everybody can hear us. Um, but um, so I do not. I mean, I hope you watched the film. Um, and you know, our press release starts with the information which you know feels crucial to me that Ruth traveled to Arkhangelsk in uh, in December 2021 <laughs> to make this film. And obviously, you know, we all remember that, you know, in Russia, um, December 2021 wasn't as horrible as it is now, but it was still very grim. Um, and the film, you know, functions a little bit as a premonition to, to the tragedy uh, that, you know, started slightly later but was actually, you know, in full swing. And, you know, I remember we had uh, an event ourselves on the 25th of February where we brought in panelists to discuss, um, you know, what's going on in Ukraine and at the time maybe on the border uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and obviously, you know, we organized that event a couple of months uh, before that, I think before Christmas, so it was very much in the air. Uh, nobody could have predicted, I mean, some people, mainly military experts, could have predicted uh, the horror that, you know, started then. Uh, but, um, so Ruth, you, 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 you were there at that time, so when you, and you know, it was a complex process, um, so you, it was it was a collaboration between several institutions. You uh, had to apply for funding, and you got it. And it was international funding. It was a very ambitious project that you know included the whole residency, and you know there were other artists. Uh, so it, it all sounds very you know uh, firstly amazing, but also very um, you know it, it, it required a lot of labor. Uh, so how you would describe your role when you know when you were traveling and you know you I know that you've you've been to Russia since like 1980s and and you speak fluent Russian uh, but and you know you've been to the Russian Arctic before so and now you were traveling to Russian subarctic uh, so how you would describe your position well, thank you very much Denise and thank you for coming um, I, I sort of want to rewind a little tiny bit because um, the project is very much a collaboration from before the beginning, if you like, because Yekaterina and I met online at a conference when everything, all conferences were online. It was the ICAS, uh, Arctic Social Sciences, big congress that they have every couple of years, I think. And we, we just realized that we were each doing things that, that were really exciting and wanted to work together and so this opportunity I was sent uh, information about this call and um, which I'm not going to go into for various geopolitical reasons <laughs> anyway but you know and uh, but we decided to I said look we've got to apply for this it's it's money to do something about climate change in Russia we have to do it together and uh, and so um, we both kind of you know stepped on it and got Got you know we're calling each other on Zoom every day and devising you know the residencies and but all the people in Arhangelsk and uh, in Piniga and Kinaziria and all the people around that I met when I went there are all friends and colleagues and acquaintances and friends of friends of Yekaterina. So you know I if I had landed there without that I would have just 
I would have been totally stuck. There was no way I would have been there. So it's very much a collaboration from the very, very beginning. And so when I arrived there, I felt very... I mean, I also knew people by the time I got there. I knew um, uh, Sasha Perkov, who's the producer and second camera. Um, I knew him because he'd been talking on Zoom already, you know, for a few weeks. It all happened... I mean, it happened quite quite quickly. You know, we only got the, the grant at the end of October. In November, I was doing a residency in Norway, in Arctic Norway. Then on the 1st of December, 30th of November, I was in Arhangelsk. So it was all very fast. And, that, and that's thanks to Yekaterina and your colleagues who, um, who, you know, worked it all out very, very quickly um, at very short notice. And remember, it was a time when you had to take COVID tests every three days. So, um, so I had to take COVID test uh, in the airport at two in the morning in Moscow, and then another one in Arhangelsk airport, uh, and then another one the next day, and, you know, constant sort of, you know, hazmat suits and COVID tests, and, um, and then, you know, in order to go anywhere. And then, of course, you're in the middle of a forest, so you can't take a COVID test. So <laughs> but people did sort of forget about that after a while, <laughs> thankfully. But um, um, so... I'd always wanted to go to Arangels. I'd wanted to go there for a, a really long time, and I'd wanted to go in winter, um, because of course I wanted to go there in winter. It's, you know, the, the Vina is frozen. It's it's beautiful, it, uh, and I'd heard about the little bridges that are put along the on the the river, that so that you can walk out onto the river because the edge of the ice is always kind of um, treacherous. So, and I stayed in this hotel called Purnavalok, which is the name of the the promontory where Arhangelsk started um, as a city, uh, however many hundred years ago it was. Um, so, so I was very excited to go as well. And I'd always wanted to go to, um, you know, spend time, or not always, but I was really interested in spending time in the Boreal Forest, which is so important to the world's um, eco, I mean, the, the world's climate, but um, is less recognized, you know, you think of the Amazon as controlling the climate, but in actual fact, it's also that boreal forest that encircles the kind of subarctic region around the world. Um, but maybe I'll let you ask another question. Um. Yeah, no, well my question would be then to Yekaterina. So um, um, Ruth has mentioned that uh, basically you uh, managed to, you know, to, to, to connect uh, the pro to, 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 to include a lot of your friends and collaborators and, you know, your, your personal networks to that project. So uh, what was um, your aim? What did you expect Ruth to, you know, to discover uh, on her trip? Because, you know, it wasn't a long trip. Uh, it was two weeks. So uh, basically the whole project depended on what you were able to, you know, to, to, to show to whom you could introduce Ruth. So what, what was um, your ambition? <coughs> uh, yes, thanks a lot again for showing the film and for the project. Um, well, I moved to Norway as an exchange student from Arkhangelsk in 2004, and I lived uh, in Norway since then. And I decided to travel back uh, to my hometown in 2015, 10, like 11 years later. Of course, you come back as a completely different, um, you know, like a global citizen. I already had my master's in history of art. And, uh, uh, well, I went back uh, with an aim to, uh, like, to return the knowledge that I got uh, the University of Oslo uh, back to my hometown and um, using arts for uh, research about identity, about local history. That was my aim in 2015. So it's like the networks that you have been talking about, they are all have been like uh, accumulated since then, basically. Uh, so we established uh, the Arctic Art Institute with uh, Alexandra Nanenko. She was a sociologist at the High School of Economics. Now she moved to Helsinki and with Ekaterina Galubina, who was actually studied uh, in London, uh, in Goldsmith. So we were like three and we made uh, lots of different projects. And then I moved to Arkhangelsk and 
started to uh, dig lots of different stories that uh, people in the town have never heard of. And one of those, uh, or I mean, maybe we heard it somewhere, like some peripheral story in your um, in your brain somewhere, you know, because how the narratives of history are told to the people in Russia is very interesting because they form identity. And uh, the stories that we have been um, listening to are the stories of the Great Patriotic War, Decembrist, like I had a very good teacher of history, but she was talking about mostly this revolutionary stories, military stories, but we didn't really know our the place of uh, where we were born. So uh, one of the sto- like examples was uh, uh, a discovery about uh, Alaska that actually the first capital of Alaska was called New Arkhangelsk, and no one in Arkhangelsk have ever heard about it. And there are so many stories like that. And one of the um, stories that I discovered uh, during like this research, uh, art-based research before Ruth came was of course this connection with England. Because when we grew up, uh, when we were students, I had my first bachelor's from Arkhangelsk, when we were students, we grew up with an idea that this is like a Soviet town, it's a periphery of Russia, everything happens in Moscow, nothing interesting has ever happened here, and we don't know anything about our own history, basically. And then suddenly, uh, through some archival research, from the digita- digitization of archives, we uh, find out that Arkhangelsk was actually the very first port, international port of Russia, uh, trading with England. So, uh, like, in you can find uh, references to Arkhangelsk in books of Mary Shelley, uh, Daniel Defoe, and many other uh, writers. <clears throat> So uh, it was uh, a kind of a revelation, especially when you come back and try to put this place, the place where you're born in more global context. And it's it's a story, these stories no one has ever heard of. So uh, like this identity work, that was we have, we have been doing for several years. And uh, yes, we met at this uh, conference which was online. And I remember that Ruth was talking about your project in Tiriberka and I was making the very first festival in Tiriberka. I was one of uh, the co-producers of that festival. And um, I remember that it's a very interesting place uh, where Leviathan was filmed, if you remember, uh, by Andrei Zviagensev. And it was also part of our Congress governorate uh, once in a time. Uh, but when I listened to the Pomor Choir, uh, I was a kind of, because I used to sing in a choir myself as a child, as a, as a teenager, and uh, I'm very well familiar with like folklore of the, of the North. And in Tiriberka, it was a kind of, they were taking a lot from Arkhangelsk. So I told to Ruth, like, look, you should go to like <laughs> to the place where you, you can meet uh, the Northern Folk Choir, where you can meet all these uh, fantastic women who actually uh, recorded uh, Bulina, recorded uh, oral epic history, uh, um, like in the 80s, they're still alive, these people. So welcome, you should uh, come, because I was in this uh, period of time and I was like, you know, discovering so many stories uh, um, that uh, no one knew anything about, you know. It's like, for example, uh, yes, the, the, the name of the of the film is A Forest Tale, and we were also talking about it because um, one of the maybe most uh, surprising discoveries uh, for me about my uh, home region was the fact that uh, Bulinas of Kiev and Rus, like the Kiev and Cyclos, they were recorded in the places where my mother is from, Pininga uh, district, where Ruth was uh, traveling. They were recorded as late as in the 80s. Um, so those who studied uh, like uh, Slavic philology are familiar that you have Novgorod Cyclos, you have Kiev and Cyclos, and Ilya Muromets is like 
from Novgorod, Sadko is um, Elia Murovic is from Kiev, Sadko is from Novgorod, and uh, there 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 were a lot of um, uh, stories stored, like uh, uh, preserved in the north when they already died out in uh, in the middle of um, uh, in the middle of the country, and even in Ukraine actually. Now it's uh, <laughs> it's a kind of challenging to talk about now, but I think it's it's also important to name this fact. So uh, yes, this was basically about. Uh, uh, of course, I saw that it's a fantastic uh, possibility to invite an artist who works with video art, and we worked a lot with video art before, and to uh, like open up this place. So that was basically the uh, the motivation. And still, uh, now I see that my task when I'm already here in Oslo to tell these stories because there's so many stories from the peripheries from the Arctic, which are actually. Mm, which no one knows about, and there are many. Uh, um, yes, basically. Thank you. Um. So yeah. Um. You 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 actually started one of the topics that I wanted to cover today is uh, you know the idea of um identity and you know uh, borders and different Arctic's. In a way, because you know, when we talk about the north, we have uh, you know we can we can talk about the north as a kind of international phenomenon. Uh, but it is interesting that um, every time we still you know uh, find ourselves in in the situations where we talk about you know the Russian north or you know uh, compare some localities. And, um, and 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 I'm leading my question to Charles because you know your book uh, is it's entitled um, uh, you know history of the Arctic. Uh, uh, obviously future, but still. Uh, but then when you look I into contents, you see that actually, you know, the structure of the book still kind of reflects on the division, you know, on the, on the like, cultural divisions, on the borderline divisions, and, you know, you have, you have a chapter dedicated exploring the Soviet Arctic, you have a chapter about uh, the American Arctic. Uh, so how does it function? Where, where do these borders uh, come from? How do they emerge? Thank you very much, Denise. Well, of course, there will be there will be people in the Arctic, many people in the Arctic, who don't see those borders and consider those borders to be uh, irrelevant to the way in which they view, mm. you know, their life ways, etc. Um, that would be true, particularly for the indigenous populations of the of the Arctic. Uh, the reason that I specifically described the, had a chapter on the Soviet Arctic is because that did represent a sort of trajectorial shift, I think, uh, for the for the Russian Arctic. Um, because there was this uh, obsession uh, in the Soviet era with the notion of defeating nature or developing the Russian Arctic. Uh, the conquest of Arctic took on this sort of ideological characteristic. Um, and of course, in the communist system, there were resources that could be thrown at this, uh, both willing resources and, of course, in the Gulag, unwilling resources that could be thrown at this, at this development. And so the, the, the post-Soviet Arctic uh, which we see now, ha has, of course, the traces of that. Uh, and that is quite distinct from the American or Canadian Arctic, where that simply wasn't, uh, that, sim that, that, that simply wasn't, simply wasn't possible. Uh, of course, Ruth has, of course, been to Murmansk and, and has, has tracked this, the sort of the, the post-Soviet Arctic. Uh, what I enjoyed about this film is that it seemed a sort of return to a, a sort of deeper, a deeper Arctic. Uh, one of one of where the traditions have managed to survive despite the Soviet Union, uh, and one also where I, I love the fact that you were you were you there was so much of nature, and so much wood. In <laughs> it's a very woody film. Yes, it is a we very. We must talk about wood at some point. It, it, it is a very well. We can talk about it right now. Uh, it it is it is a very woody film, but it reminded me of the fact that. Um, that you know, wood the trees are very beautiful, but wood is also uh, is also one of the reasons precisely why there's that connection between England and Arkhangelsk and Scotland. I have to say as well. And Scotland, yes. actually, Richard Chamberlain was a Scot. I, I mean, not Chamberlain, Richard Chancellor, who was a found well, 
sort of one of the founders of Archangel. Um, check it out on Wikipedia. <laughs> That's all <laughs> I did. Um, <laughs> no, I also sort of went to the museum. But I have a, a friend whose surname is um, Chancellor, and I, and I wrote to him as soon as I got back, and I said, are you any relation of Richard Chancellor? And he said, yes, yes, he was. Uh, you know, and it's a sort of complicated story about, you know, them changing from uh, Protestant to Catholic to Protestant and, you know, all, the, all, all our complicated history here. But uh, so Scots as well, Lowland Scots. But, um, but actually what took me, what I, one of the thing, reasons I wanted to go to Archangel was, was actually my American family background because um, one of my ancestors was, who was born before the American Revolution, as we call it, um, uh, he was the first sea captain into the port of Arhangelsk, of Archangel. And so, um, and some of his logbooks and stuff have been, have are in an archive and because it was locked down I wasn't able to get to that archive it's the Peabody in, uh, Museum in, um, in uh, um, Salem Massachusetts but um, I asked the, the marine the, the curator the director of the um, Maritime Museum in Arhangelsk about, about him and about whether I might be able to find something he was like well he probably had to have repairs done on his ship so you could probably go through the archives of what repairs were done in ships and then early 19th century. I didn't have time to do that. But maybe, you know, in an ideal world, or I can, maybe I can find somebody else to do it for me. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, but, um, but yes, yeah, so they were really, they were such international traders. And it's, and it's really, um, and it is really, it's really, that side of it is really interesting. And uh, I had come across that, the trade in wood, um, uh, from w uh, making another film on the other side of the White Sea. So um, in Karelia mm -hmm. in 2013, called Call of North because they are they were they were exporting um, lumb, uh, timber uh, to um, build ships um, in in Britain but and also the the Gula uh, the um, the Sul of Key archipelago which is in the middle of the White Sea where they were um, I mean it was the richest uh, monastery in Russia I mean it was hugely wealthy and they exported um, uh, they had a nice Tsarist prison underneath it, of course, and it was the first gulag. The gulag archipelago um, was based on that gulag. But they were big exporters of fish, of salmon especially, there's as well. There's so. a, there, there's a pa I was told a story. I went to Silovki. Uh, oh, fantastic. Uh, some years ago, indeed, via Archangel, in fact. But uh, I was told that in the White Sea, this rather romantic story, and I which I wish to be true, uh, which is that because there was so much exported from that part of Russia, mostly lumber, uh, and when the ships came back from England or from Scotland, uh, well, there was, there was nothing that needed to be in those ships because there, was, there were very few people in that part of Russia, very little to sell to them uh, from England and from Scotland. And so, therefore, the ships would have to have, so they didn't keel over in the water, they would have to have some kind of ballast, and so the ballast they had was soil, uh, as a result of which, I was told rather romantically, but it probably is true, um, that when they arrived in the White Sea, they would, of course, have to get rid of this ballast. And so, really, there'd be whole areas of sort of the land near the sea, which are actually British soil, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, 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 I like the idea <laughs> of. <laughs> yes. Sort of literal colonization. Well, but, like but, it, but, but, but British pol polders. <laughs> but, but, it, but it also gets to this point, which people sometimes forget, which is before railways, etc., before planes. If you were by the sea, then that, that was much made you much more accessible to the world. And so you were talking it clearly still about... Still does there. It's still, it, well, we're talking about it sort of being, on the one hand, a periphery, but on the other hand, it is at the centre of these, of these roots, and that's, that's a very interesting, I think, dichotomy. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah. Um. Shall I say a little bit about wood and what brought yes. us to yeah. the project? Because... Um, I made another... F I was... At the time we were planning this film, or rather you know, before we'd planned it, but we were talking about it. I was working on another film called Tree Line, which is currently um, on show at the Whitechapel Gallery, little plug, um, and also online. Um, uh, so everyone who's watching on YouTube, it's online. Um, and uh, I talked to Yekaterina about this film, which is made up of uh, footage of forests around the world, so shot all over the place. And um, I talk to you, Katerina, about asking, uh, about doing a little sort of online workshop with some of her students and um, other people about them going out and filming 
the Boreal Forest for the film, and they did. And I did a little online, you know, Zoom, this, not really a workshop, but, you know, we just talked about the film. And so we'd already, we sort of collaborated on that. And then we were talking about developing this new project. And I was like, well, what I'd really like to do is, like, Treeline is this kind of really expansive film that goes all across the world. It goes to the Amazon and the Boreal Forest and, or, you know, all over the world, every continent except for Antarctica. And I'd really like to then sort of zero in on one particular forest and look really close up and sort of have the forest sort of speaking back in a way to us and, and sort of try to explore what that ecosystem is like, what that eco-cultural ecosystem, you know, the traditions, everything that kind of, all the traditions there in a way come out of the forest. You know, all the houses are built of wood, the all the tools are wood, the, the trade is because of wood, the ships are made of wood, the, you know, and yet we think of modernity, or we have until recently, thought of modernity as you know, glass and steel and, and you know, satellite dishes and um, speed. And now we need to think of a kind of, and actually incidentally, a lot of sort of modernist architecture in, in Arhangelsk is built wood, <laughs> because that's the material there. There are lots of there are lots of buildings that are you know from that were kind of construct some constructivist buildings and some kind of more not you wouldn't call them constructivist but they're of that same period and a bit later and they're made of wood. And now we need to go use materials that are not you know concrete or especially in the Arctic it's totally inappropriate and it, and we're seeing with melting permafrost how it is totally inappropriate. So uh, we were thinking of like, you know, can we somehow, you know, take, um, look, you know, look back at those traditions to in order to look forward. So in a way, a bit of a future history of, of the Arctic in a way, thinking about like how do we, how can we learn from those old traditions, those old skills and the, the, and the culture around it and the communities around it. To, towards building a better future and you know and, and, and that was also one of the reasons for t sort of taking young art or not taking young art but inviting and having this sort of mini summit in the, in the forest of people from not from there as well as from from there so we had artisans from uh, you know woodworkers who were working there in the forest and then we had artists who were showing all over the place who were interested in in working with wood and interested in this idea um, to then be meet each other and, and talk about and talk about wood. Talk about what you can do where, with where it. Where is the, the centre of wooden architecture in the world? It must exist. It's probably in Finland, isn't it? I'm just Well there's a Swedish project where they're, where they're doing um skyscrapers, which right. is talked about actually in the film. Yes. Um Lulia. Lulio. Lulio. Yes. There was I remember visiting years ago a wooden skyscraper just outside of Arkhangelsk, built <laughs> by a rather remarkable man. Um who was a sort of, well, he was basically, when I went up there, he was fighting with the Russian state because the Russian state, he shouldn't be able to build this this extraordinary construction. And he built sort of, you know, three floors and then four floors and then five floors and then seven floors. I'm sure that you will know him, Katarina, this story of the, this... Uh, yeah, well, yes, of course. Down. What is his name? Nikolai. And his surname yeah. is Satyagin, I think. Uh, and uh, he was he was one of these northerners who had decided to use that material well it didn't end very well i'm afraid uh, but it's good to know that now that, that the wooden wooden buildings are of course being built all over the world and it's a uh, you know it's, it's a thing i think that the case of nikolai suchag and he's very famous actually and i think um it's the kind of an example of this uh, freedom actually and creative chaos which I saw in Russia when I just came there after being in Norway, because uh, uh, in a way, everything is allowed. You know, you have laws and people do not follow the laws until a certain moment when they come to prison, you know. The same story with Sutyagin. He started to build this uh, skyscraper outside of Arkhangelsk, and it's a kind of very interesting and very romantic idea, you know, like he just builds and builds and builds. And it was in the 90s, in this chaotic time, 
and I think he had uh, good contacts both with mafia and with city administration. Um, and yes, he managed, but then something happened and it burned down and uh, another, it was actually another story I was discovering when I worked there. In 2016, I took one of my students and we took a taxi to this Salombola, to the historical island where Peter I uh, built, built his very first shipyard in Russia. It was not in St. Petersburg, it was in Arkhangelsk actually. Uh, and I remember we took a taxi, it was raining and we were supposed to find this Sutyagin, you know. This student of mine, she thought that I'm completely crazy. <laughs> uh, and we just walked around in Salombola because you could not see this skyscraper anymore. And we just came to one house there and knocked on the door and like, where is this famous house here? Uh, yes, and I, I, I just saw a man uh, <laughs> climbing out of a burnt uh, banya. It's like, um, that's what you have left after all these adventures, you know. He was trying to build this skyscraper of wood and then he had this, uh, like, uh, uh, just rests of uh, everything. I, I one uh, artist from Nizhny Novgorod, he was interested to make a project with him. Uh, Artyom Filatov. Um, I think it's a very interesting example of uh, this crazy freedom, because Norway is very regulated, you know, it's like really regulated. And in... in in a way, when you come to Russia, you feel this like complete freedom. Do what you want until you make a certain step and then you are in jail. <laughs> um, yes, but um, about wood, I think um, I I actually lived in a wooden house in Arkhangelsk and I remember very well being a teenager how uh, it was not really cool, you know, um, it's it was very old fashioned, not modern, uh, like modern people, and uh, they don't live in wooden houses. And this was like nineties, two thousands. And um, when we worked with Arctic Art Institute uh, with different projects and doing the Arctic Art Forum, we made a, a project uh, together with our Swedish partners called Wood is Cool. It was a kind of interdisciplinary project with architects and theater actors about wood. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, when I come to Norway, you have wood all around. Um, and uh, we try to, um, to bring more attention to, to wood uh, among young people and maybe Ruth, you remember Vladislav Dreka, he was studying architecture and is one of the main activists in town. I remember my very first talk uh, with him because his uh, dissertation was about beton, uh, concrete. And when I talked about uh, wood, he was like, and what? It's like, it's not cool, it's not interesting. Then I showed to him some skyscrapers from Sweden and from Norway and he was like completely yeah so um uh, yes I think uh, I think uh, and I really want to hope that um, this could be possible uh, in future because uh, we don't really know what will happen in the nearest future in Russia and I talked to my colleagues um, no one really has very long, horizontal of planning now but i really hope that we will be able to do something more in the region also about wood um but i'm very i, I think I, I, yeah i wanted to interfere and um uh, you know um ask about this tension uh, that is uh, uh, that exists there in this connection between you know tradition and sustainability you know, we very often refer to it, but, you know, in the Russian context, when we think, you know, very, very often, m a lot of your interlocutors in the film, uh, you know, they tried to recreate, you know, some old uh, traditional way of doing things like an 18th century approach to ship making or, or something like that. Uh, but then when we think, you know, from where these 
uh, technologies uh, um, are coming, and you know they are coming from the uh, from the beginning of Russian imperialist project in a way that those were the technologies which were developed in the 18th century, you know, to to um, discover the north and to you know to to venture into Siberia. And I'm thinking about you know Ural's mountains, which got completely deforestated because of those uh, projects. So in a way. Their, their their sustainability is uh, like relies on their ineffectiveness, uh, and, and, uh, but then when we think about you know more effect and and you know and in London it's kind of the same when you know we have the traditional way of like burning coal which is of course you know contributes to the air pollution and then we have something more you know uh, technologically modern you know gas and and it clears the air and and it's interesting you know to to how like, is it possible to be, like, uh, how, how to, how, to, like, is it possible to look at these dialectics of, of you know, tradition and sustainability? Well, that's a very good question, <coughs> um, which I'm probably not equipped to answer completely at all. But, uh, in fact, I don't know whether anybody's <coughs> equipped to answer it prop completely. But, I mean, speaking of deforestation, there have been waves of kind of... Um, uh, you know, deforestation and climate catastrophes and depopulation because of over um, cutting down too much wood. So the first place I went to in Karelia, Chupa, which is on the um, west coast, uh, it's actually sort of around about the Arctic Circle. Um, it was um, set up as a, as a charcoal uh, producing place for Salavki. So they produced, um, they burned the trees that were growing everywhere to make charcoal in order to smoke the fish that was on, on the that was caught in the in the White Sea for export. They, so they exported salmon and they ate white fish, which was kind of common and you know common garden white fish. But anyway, but they over they and because it's it's the Arctic, it's not it's not hot enough to just dry salt. So they sorry they bake charcoal. There was charcoal for smoking fish, but there was also there was charcoal for they burned the um, trees also to dry the salt, <coughs> sorry, for preserving fish. So they'd smoke fish, but also salt fish. So they cut down. And I, I heard that, that Chupa closed, sort of disappeared as a place in the sort of early 19th century. I mean, and then it revived again in the, in the 20th century um, for different reasons, because of the railway, because of the, the St. Petersburg Mormans Railway. Um, but anyway, so they cut down a lot of trees everywhere and uh, and most of the forest that I I mean I didn't see any virgin any any old growth forest I mean none of the trees that are in the film are old growth they are they are none of them are more than a hundred years old um, because they've all been forested I mean it's all been uh, forested the only bits of old growth I asked the um, the boss I asked I can't remember who I asked I asked uh, I think it was um, it was somebody from the um, National Park of Kinaziria, which is where like, the first uh, the part of the film, where the, there's a sort of wooden church tower on the hill, the, the very sort of very cold scene, very cold scene with no people and lots of dogs, that's in Kinaziria. I asked them about old growth forest, and there isn't any much. There's a little bit in the areas that are very difficult to get to, very, very swampy areas. There are trees that haven't been lumbered I mean it haven't been cut and grown again but otherwise uh, you know it's all fairly recent relatively recent um, and you know they're trying to restore it what's really interesting about that national park and it is sustainable and it does come back to your actually to your question which is about they're, they're they have a sort of three-pronged approach so it's about cultural I mean it's the ecological sustainability so restoration and restoring the forests and, and maintaining the forest. So you can cut trees, but you have to have a license. You can only cut a certain amount. Everybody burns wood for, for fires, but it's all birch and you don't need that much. I mean, you don't literally don't actually need that much and birch grows really fast and it reseeds itself quite well as well. Um, so, but environmental sustainability, um, sort of restoration, conservation, cultural sustainability. So the reason why the National Park of Kinesiri was founded was because of depopulation in the 80s. Everyone was leaving the countryside to go to the cities and therefore everything was falling into disrepair. And 
and, and the villages were emptying out. And that's a story everywhere. And that's not just a story in Russia. That's a story across the north. That's the story, I mean, it's across the story in the north of Scotland. I hear the same story in the north of Scotland. And it's because there aren't any jobs, there's nothing to do, it, it, you know, people can't afford it, it's expensive, oil and gas, you know, everything is expensive and there's nothing to do. So, so, and the, so the third, th so they were wanting to restore, um, you know, sustain villages, train people in ecological tourism, so they, they run courses there on how to, you know, have ecological tourism, because there is an interest in, in kind of wild tourism and so on. Um, and the third one is the restoration and maintenance of, of the cultural heritage, because it's very important for wooden churches and those beautiful villages that are, you know, kind of fairy tale villages. So they were had this kind of three-pronged approach. And I was talking to a friend who's an historian, uh, we've, we've worked together, written together, and she knows a lot about Salaki and spent a lot of time there. Um, and she was saying the thing is, the problem with Salaki is that they don't, they don't have um, kind of nature protection at all. So there's the cultural preservation orders, the sort of state. So the state has a huge uh, uh, impact. The kinds of the laws that, you know, that, that may be broken by artists on the side doing whatever and they get away with it until they get sent to jail. But, um, but the, in terms of like preserving nature, unless you, she's, she said, Yulia said that if you preserve nature, then it's a lot easier to preserve the culture, right? <laughs> because, you know, people want to preserve culture. They want to preserve the churches and so on. But cutting down trees is really, you know, you want to cut them down as close to where you live as possible because it's easier. <laughs> and and <then> <laughs> but it's actually, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, na nature protection in the Arctic can also be used for other purposes, uh, mm. which is, I think, an, an interesting sort of side question. Yeah. So, for example, putting a, making the whole of Nevada Zemnia a, uh, a, a you know a, a state park is a way of preventing people from coming in and discovering that actually the Soviet Union dumped all kinds of nuclear material there. Uh, and similarly with the, the Northern Sea Route, which is this route across the whole of the north of Russia, across the Arctic, between Europe and Asia, there's a you know the use of environmental legislation to basically determine who is able to access these, water, access these waters or not. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a big geopolitical question. So it's interesting well the way yeah. that environmental issues and geopolitical issues can very much, um, you know, butt up against one another or else, or else overlap. I did want to come back to one thing that you'd mentioned, Denise. You mentioned the, um, you know, th this, th that in your film, there is this scene where they're rebuilding a ship in the, in the 18th century style. Um, but that's not just, the thing that's very interesting to me about that is it's not just sort of, you know, it's, you know, people who like dressing up in clothing and fighting battles. You know, it's not just historical reenactment. Um, because what you say in the film is that uh, this is the, or somebody says in the film, is the design of the ship is the same that was used by Fritjof Nansen, the Norwegian explorer, when he built the Fram. And the Fram is the, uh, the ship that went into the, the Arctic and where Fritjof Nansen was basically able to get as close to the North Pole or close to the North Pole than anyone had previously. Um, through this, uh, and he also discovered polar drift um, by getting himself stuck in the ice. You might not think that's a very good idea, but previously, people had built boats and they'd gone into the Arctic and they they died basically because they built a boat that you know they tried to build it really strong against the ice, and then eventually they discovered that nature is stronger than man uh, or humankind, and uh, and that the ships would be crushed. Uh, the Pomors knew about this. And so they, they designed ships long, long before where the ship would rise up on the ice. So that instead of trying to fight against nature, it would go with the grain of nature. Uh, and so... But Nansen, but Nansen used this on a larger yeah. scale. Yeah. But, th but I think, I think sort of as, a sort of as a sort of metaphor, I think that's quite a powerful one yeah. uh, of how one, you know, maybe it's best not to try and fight against nature. Maybe sometimes it's better to try and learn some things. I wanted to say um, I it's interesting how much animism in all this discourse in a way that, you know, um, nature is perceived either as a gift giver, you know, something to benefit from, you know, you collaborate with nature and then, you know, it helps you and it creates, you know, different, I mean, it, it provides you with, with resources and with, like, with, with the 
helpful environment and and vice versa it can it, it, it becomes an enemy and you know we uh, there there are like brilliant academic works that describe uh, the role of nature as a socialist enemy uh, that uh, the Soviet Union has to fight and basically the whole uh, imperial project is based on you know fighting this enemy you know uh, which which you know how each ideology has uh, some enemy that that um, prevents the, the the paradise to and nature becomes this kind of um, enemy that needs to be conquered that needs to be fight against and it's interesting how much similarity there is between two positions because you know nature is you know a caregiver and 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 you know an entity to be dealt with but that it's very much a kind of sort of othering of it if you like i mean and i think in in my film that is not the 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 nature that you see um at least that's what I, I and that's certainly the experience that I had, and I was and I was trying to get that across. And I, you know, I've I've sort of developed this way of making films with a kind of polyphony of different voices, without any kind of r resolving or overarching uh, kind of narrative, except in Hero City, but that's a different sort of film. But um, where so each voice kind of has it, the voices all have um, a kind of equal status, if you like, and they're all speak, and some of them are non-human so um and to me it was really that that is a really important way of sort of feeling or understanding a sense that that there is agency beyond the individual human and that um and i was trying to get that across in the film and the it certainly fe felt like the the animals and the trees um and the birds uh are far more at home in a way <laughs> in that climate and in that situation than humans who have to wrap up, you know, and take, you know, put loads of clothes on and then, you know, it's a trudge and it's hard and especially if you're carrying a camera which keep with the battery keeps dying and um, and you have to go back in and charge it and then you have to take all your clothes off and then, you know, and just glasses steam up and, <laughs> and the b everything steams up and then so. And that whereas the dogs are just hanging out in the street, <laughs> and you they're know they're a having time. a social, they're so sociable, and they had such, they were really charming. I mean, I've come across you know husky, all those kinds of dogs, um, in the Russian North, every place I've been, and they're not always as friendly as that. When I was in Chupa, they were super, super territorial. I mean, you could not go anywhere near them. I thought I was going to be ripped to shreds. Um, Whereas there, they were just coming and rolling around, <laughs> like a, you know, they were, they were, they were totally in control, and they were, I mean, they just were, you know, uh, they were in their element, and um, and uh, and those poor little tits, you know, sitting there on their puffed out into like little, you know, little balls of feather in order to keep warm, but you know, they're still out there. <laughs> um, anyway, I found that that side of it. I mean, you really seek out sort of live things when it's that cold. I have to uh, say, it's one thing I really love about this film is that you you the the, the it's not obviously not an exclusive focus on the animals, but clearly you have an eye and a, for an anticipation of when s when an animal's about to do something. You know, they always say you know filmmakers shouldn't work with children and animals. I think that's what you know. But yeah. well, you seem to do it very well. Because well, you, because you, yeah. you, you, you can, you can see that the, the, the character of the animals and their sense of possession over where they are, their sense of comfort where they are, and I find that actually it's a very, it's very appealing, very appealing. I think it's about just, um, it's sort of about just sort of sitting there and just, you know, being a kind of, just waiting and, you know, just not, not trying to do too much. Not trying to move about too much, but you do have to move about a bit, though, otherwise you get really cold. <laughs> but but sort of just giving things the time, the time it takes, rather than trying to impose your rhythm on it. You know, like, oh, I've got to have, like, you know, this many shots today, and I've got to do this and that, and then I need to go to such and such a place. And I'm always having to say, well, no, maybe we don't go to the next place. Let's just spend a bit more time here. Because, or, or hang on, I'm just going to go and wander off for a bit. <laughs> And just to sit around and, and wait and see what happens. And then it's the same with talking to people as well. It's like if you have a set of, you know, questions you have to ask, then people quite often have a set piece. <coughs> they say the thing that they've been, uh, they've been saying before. They tell the story the way they've told it before. 
you know, a visitor comes, somebody comes from far away, and you tell the story that you've told before. But if you just sort of, you know, kind of wait and and don't really ask too many questions and and just kind of chat, things come out that are less expected, or you notice something that, and I don't mean, it sounds like I'm sort of, you know, I've, it's not very premeditated, I'm very, I am quite sort of intuitive in the way I do it. I mean, I do think, I do try to do a lot of research before I go, so I was reading Bilini and and Sarini and re reading about um, ch uh, Chancellor, thanks to you, Ekaterina, you gave me a nice big reading list and kept sending me brilliant videos of like that woman in the 1980s reciting Bilini online, it was incredible. Um, so I would do lots of research, but then get there and in a way just sort of like forget it all and just see what comes. Which is just as well, because if you're too c intent on doing a particular thing, when the car breaks down, it's very disappointing. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so so I'm interested in all the voices and that you that you come across. There's also the editing, though. Sometimes it can make I can make it look like um, there's some there's some neat little edits there where you know the birds bounce at the axe and stuff. I mean, they probably did bounce. You're saying at that's the axe. not true. No, no, the birds do bounce at a loud noise, but it might not be the loud noise that is actually in the film. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't really want to ask about authenticity, did you? <laughs> actually, uh, one question, uh, and I think that will be the last question from me. Um, so y y it's, it's amazing how you insert so many voices into the film, and my question is, uh, how come so many of these voices are singing? What's the particular significance of that? Well, quite early on, we were invited to the wedding party, to the wedding feast, and I mean, I you knew, uh, um, Yekaterina knew this group, and Yelena Vadova, uh, Vadova, I can't pronounce her name again, sorry. And and Sasha, who was filming with me, knew them already, so he knew what to expect. And um, but I didn't, I didn't know. And then suddenly we were invited into this kind of amazing wedding party. It was a wedding party, and and I felt so welcomed in. And and the singing and the talking sort of seemed to drift in between each other. And there was no there was no like break between it. It was like you know they'd be talking and then it'd be like start singing and um, and so it just felt very natural and the stories are so brilliant the stories in the song are so brilliant um, I mean I have a lot more footage than I used um, but I felt that in a way it was just uh, it was just as natural to be singing as to be speaking and why n and why not and also it connects that past with the with the present and the future it's sort of it's sort of very specific and at the same time kind of timeless. There's a sort of interesting sort of mystery about singing where it can, it's folk singing in particular, where it can be very contemporary because it's about the particular context, the particular moment which you've, where you've all gathered and, and you maybe will alter the song slightly to adapt to the, to the audience, to the people who are there. And they're not just audience, they're participants and audience at the same time. And yet it also harks back to the stories that have been sung for forever and nobody knows who sang it first. So that, that was why, in a way, it was like, it brings it... But also it's just, they're, just, they're singing polyphony as well. And, and in a way, the rest of the soundtrack is also polyphony. Um, I mean, perhaps not as, uh, not as melodious always, but... Um, yeah, and I often use voices, singing voices, in my films, or I have in recent years, anyway. Um, I guess I'm also interested in the fact that it's this all-female choir. There's a kind of, you know, and maybe it was particularly at this time as well of, of you know, the build-up of troops uh, on the border, this kind of really appalling militaristic kind of um, re rhetoric, which is carrying on, of course. Um, I mean, not just rhetoric, but the rhetoric is there as well. And that the kind of the these these women's choir, this, this, these women's voices are really undercutting. They're undercutting men's aggression and and warmongering at every step. So I think there was also that. It's like it's quite um, 
uh, yeah, the women are quite strong in the film, I think. <laughs> so. One also felt that they were they were friends as well. There was a sometimes when you see choirs sing, you know, everyone's facing forward to the audience. They don't look at each other at all. Of course, these women at one point they were sitting around a table, but there was an, a lovely intimacy between them and a sort of nudge and a wink between them, which I thought was just fantastic. Uh, were they always like that? Yes, they were. Yeah, they are friends, and some of them are related to each other, and they've been singing together for 20 years or longer, and some of them are from the same village. And yeah, and then the other choir, because there are two choirs. In fact, I have three choirs, but I decided that two choirs is maybe enough for a half-hour film. Um, and, and also the third choir was more sort of performing for me, so not just for me, but for us, and I didn't, so I wanted the more informal ones. So the other choir is really in this village in the middle of really like really far away from everywhere, Porcha um, Choir. So, um, yeah, they all know each other. I mean, the one where they're talking about, the woman talks about working in the factory and how exhausting it was, and um, yeah, they, they, they all know each other as well. Nicterina, can you comment on that? Uh, how important yes, yes. is singing for these communities that uh, <coughs> Ruth had the privilege to encounter? Well, when we started uh, folklore, uh, because my first education is uh, rather inter interdisciplinary, but we had a very like uh, big focus on philology. And uh, one of the theories um, uh, says that singing or music uh, and text, um, they helped people uh, during their work. So like Northern songs, they were actually performed uh, during these long winter nights because uh, the, uh, the time of harvesting was very short, like from May maybe until September. And in October, you already have the first snow uh, in Arkhangelsk area and around in Murmansk even earlier like in those areas. Uh, but uh, before the revolution and before the industrialization um, in the USSR, uh, people used to live in these huge wooden houses. Uh, there was no any like slavery, like no, no. One of the things that Northerners are very proud about to just constantly refer, there was no any slavery and people after this like summer jobs they had they gathered in these large houses and they were doing some uh, um, crafts uh, made of wood of uh, birch um, uh, textiles uh, lots of different stuff and uh, during this like long days and nights and winter when they were working, they sang, they were singing. It was very natural. And Northern songs, they're very, very long. So people didn't have any TV. They didn't have any, you know. So And also Bellini, Pomors, when they went to the to Svalbard or to, uh, to Norway or when they just were fishing, they were entertaining each other with, uh, Belinas or songs or Belina basically is a very is very simple melody melody uh, uh, and it's it was a part of entertainment I'm sure it was in in England for a long time ago as well and was in Nordic countries before modernity came with all this like division between a performer and the public uh, or a, a screen and uh, lots of people watching the screen, you know. Culture was produced uh, more collectively and uh, everyone was co-producer. And uh, I named, uh, I told her before that I sang in a folk choir myself and uh, I feel kind of this connection with Piniga people. And this choir you have been talking about, all these women, they come from Piniga. And Piniga and Mizein, they are two uh, districts where most uh, the northern areas uh, of Arkhangelsk region and where uh, most of Bulinos were actually collected. Pininka, Kuloi, uh, Mizen, and so on. So, and these are the areas where Pomors uh, used to live. And people, they just, uh, you know, like even now, today, 
they go to their normal jobs, but uh, especially for this choir that you met, uh, because there are many different choirs and of different quality, for them it's a kind of singing together, it's a connection to their small villages in Pininka district. And they have been there for, they have been together for a very long time. There's no any uh, propaganda or whatever. They have been together uh, with the rock musicians. They have been experimenting a lot uh, with uh, different, uh, different bands and stuff. Um, and uh, also they sing not only Belina, Belina is more like a heroical epos about Ilya Muramans and stuff, but they also do Skamaroshina, and Skamaroshina is actually a, like a medieval punk, you can say. It's a kind of uh, mocking song where, uh, um, you know, you are criticizing the power in a way. And they were performing it and they were doing it and they knew the meaning of it because... I also met some choirs in the region who were not connected to the land. They were just uh, hired from some other places around Russia. They didn't really have an idea of what they're singing about. But these women, they are singing their own story. And it inspires me a lot when people perform their own stories. I also worked with Sami artists and... Uh, it's uh, very special when you uh, when you sing the story of your ancestors, when you have this ownership of it. So, uh, especially this choir, they do they do have this connection. Mm. Thank you. So, I think we are ready uh, for the questions from the audience. So, um, who wants to start? Oh, interesting. Hello. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for this uh, event. I'm from Australia and we definitely don't get events like this in Australia. So I'm so grateful to be here tonight. Um, uh, that's also a segue into saying that I haven't seen your film, Ruth and Ekaterina. I'm so sorry, uh, but I do intend on seeing it. I'm fresh off the boat, only three weeks here. Um, but you have promised a lot of wood, so I'm hoping there's a Twin Peaks level of wood in there. Um, I have quite a selfish question to start off with. Uh, I'm an empirical researcher myself. I did my, I've done all my research on post-Soviet identity. My master's research was in the North Caucasus. Uh, my PhD research, which I'm currently halfway through my PhD, um, is in Central Asia. Uh, if there's any time for socializing after this, uh, no one asked me about my PhD. It's going terrible. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about building trust with interlocutors as an outsider to the post-Soviet space and the uh, Russian space. Um, I found it really difficult, particularly within the last year or so, to, I guess, um, convince people that it's safe to, you know, say something that isn't necessarily in line with the regime. Um, obviously, there are dire consequences for people if they do say things like that, um, particularly if they're talking to a foreigner uh, and a Western foreigner at that. So I was just wondering if you could perhaps speak to that a little bit. And again, I'm sorry for the selfish question, everyone, but I'm taking my chance. <laughs> um, <coughs> it's not a selfish question, it's fine. Um, I haven't been to Russia since the war. I finished editing the film the night before the invasion of Ukraine, literally the night before the invasion. That's when we sent it to the museum in Arhangel. So I haven't been since then. But um, uh, so the first part of your question is like, I, th I, I feel there's a very, in a way, I feel like I'm a, I'm a visitor. Um, I do speak Russian, so I've taken the trouble to spend you know, more than half my life, <laughs> quite a lot more than half my life, um, <laughs> speaking Russian. And, um, you know, and I've, so, so everybody likes it when someone's made the effort to, to learn their language. Actually, people don't generally notice if you learn the language. They notice when you don't know the language, but they don't notice if you do. So, so that, that, but, you know, if they think about it, then they appreciate it. Um, but usually people don't actually notice. But that's quite good, because that means you're just, you know, you're just there, you're just somebody visiting. So, um, and actually, there's something in a, in a book, um, Staying with the Trouble by Donna Haraway, where she says somewhere, 
um, she talks about just visiting as a kind of as a as a way of approaching wherever you're going and I think it's a really and I've, I've ever since I read it I thought yeah that's that's what I feel because you you have to step lightly if you're visiting you're not you know I don't I go with a very small kit I um I had a little bit more this time because I was working with people there and so we had two camera people and two uh, and, and more elaborate camera equipment than I normally have because I can't carry more than a certain you know quite a small amount so so I'm actually not really carrying all that much and sometimes I'll bring out a sound recorder but if somebody says they don't want me to record then I won't and I'll just be like well okay uh, that's fine um, and I and it's just you know all interesting it's you know it's uh, it's my life and it's interesting <laughs> and some of it will find its way into a film and some of it won't but it'll all find its way into me and then some of it will come out in some way or other so I guess not being feeling too uh, precious about having to always have everything on the record or um, because I have interviewed a lot of people or spoken with lots of people who have not been willing to have anything recorded in any way um, and I respect that completely because uh, a lot of people have had a, have suffered a huge amount. Um, not less. I mean, and obviously in the last year, but I mean before that, the sorts of suffering. There's no end of suffering. Um, so, so being a visitor, you're also reliant on hospitality, and I also feel that it's really important to put, you know, to make your not make yourself vulnerable. You are vulnerable. Everyone's vulnerable, but to share stories as well of like my stories too. I mean, I'm not just there to kind of extract stories from people. I'm there to meet people and and share experiences. And I brought a nice bottle of uh, single malt whiskey from Scotland when I went. Actually, I bought it in the airport. But, you know, it was originally from Scotland. <laughs> but, you know, a single nice single malt. From the, thankfully, you can these days. Anyway, so I, you know, when people share with, you know, their, um, oh, what's it called again? That, that, that um, sort of really syrupy alcohol that you have in the in the north. What's it called again? Uh, Nastoika. No, it's the one that I forget. Balsam, balsam, balsam. The balsam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, interesting stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, that's very northern. So have go to go to the north and have balsam. Uh, so yeah. So um, I guess sharing your own stories and your own vulnerabilities and being very sensitive. I mean, I'm sure that that's the case wherever you are, really. And just respecting people's, uh, you know, some people you warm to, some people you don't. Some people warm to you and some people don't. Uh, and obviously, you know, there are certain, you know, it took a long time, actually. It's, it's easier for me as a woman, you know, probably to, to enter into the all-female environment and meet people there than it is for me to enter the shipbuilding environment where, you know, it took a while to people to warm up there. And I did, you know, talk about, I don't know, I talked about a bit of shipbuilding in, you know, in America that I'd seen and stuff, but I'm not very knowledgeable about shipbuilding, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have sailed on a wooden ship, a drifter, a herring drifter, a <coughs> Shetland herring drifter, which is not entirely dissimilar to what they're building there. So I did talk about that a bit as well. You know, I just kind of, you know, scrabble around in my experience to share little anecdotes. But actually, people are more interested in talking about what they're doing anyway. So, yeah, sometimes actually people open up more because you're going away. Because you're not there. They don't have to deal with the consequences of, you know, letting off steam. <laughs> I don't know if you found that that experience as well. I could actually add as well because. Um, no, thank you for your question. Thank you. And asking the first question is always difficult as well. I, yes, I could actually add uh, on this. Um, um, before, um, fascinating okay. um, discussion. Um, I have a question, uh, probably to all panel members. Um, regarding um, the myth-making um, associated with exploration of the Arctic, um, particularly 
sort of the making of the mythology, the, um, the politics and the propaganda associated with um, exploration of the Arctic and more sort of not as far as Belline as um, uh, Ekaterina was referring to, but sort of modern myth making. Um, specifically, I'm referring to possibly apocryphic story about um, Cheluskin's expedition and um, the story about the ghost ship called Pijma that might have been or might have not been accompanying Cheluskin and to see what you kind of think about this modern mythology, whether it has value and um, whether there is a kind of continuity associated with myth making and kind of more of a gulag period of Archangel. Shall I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's, a, there, there's a lot there. I mean, uh, I mean one, one thing I've always found very interesting about the Arctic is that it's, for many people, it's something onto which they project their desires, their fears, uh, and that has really, and I think that still happens now, um, so that the age of exploration is, you know, why did it excite so many people's imaginations in the 17th, 18th, 19th century? Well, partly, for, of course, for economic motives, but it still excites people imag people's imaginations now. And I think there is some similarity uh, with the way in which some people can perceive, for example, the, the extraction of natural resources from the Arctic as having a sort of heroic element to it. Now, I don't view it that way. But uh, I think there is a, there's, a, there's, th th there's a way in which the age of exploration sort of bleeds into the way in which people still look at the Arctic uh, as sort of, a, you know, a bit of a free fall or an empty place. People often imagine people don't live in the Arctic. Um, and and I, so I, th I think it, it, has a, it has a long imperial colonial uh, legacy in effect. Uh, and it's one that isn't uh, always very easily examined. One thing which is very interesting in the Arctic, if you speak to indigenous peoples of the Arctic, is they will often claim that environmental groups uh, uh, will have a, have a view of their, their life ways, which is, from their perspective, extremely paternalistic, colonial, you know, the view of a southerner, essentially. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's complicated, um, but the, 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 the age of exploration st in the Arctic still has this, it still sort of hangs over the way in which we think about it. Yeah, and I, w I would add that, uh, that um, you know, the, the, that it is different depending on the different country in, in the Arctic as well. That each of these uh, um, kind of mythologies is slightly different. I have a, a I'm, I've been to a lot of different polar museums and they have different kind of emphases. They all have a kind of uh, myth making going on, definitely. Um, I mean, if you go to Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge, it's still like around Shackleton and Scott, and there's other stuff too. I mean, there's lots of discussion about it. I'm an associate at the Scott Polar Research Institute, and the lo there are a lot of people uh, working there who would like to change that or, you know, shift it, and they do, and they do kind of expand on it and change it. And, you know, but that, you know, it is called the Scott Polar Research Institute. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, so, and the Russian history is different again. Um, and the Canadian history and the American history also different, and the Norwegian and the um, history too. But they all have this myth-making, you're absolutely right. Um, I did an exhibition here actually three years ago called Icebreaker Dreaming, which was very much about countering that as well. Um, and uh, the... Um, I've also written about this recently um, a b a b uh, in, a, in a book about uh, called Ice Humanities, which is in the, li in the bookshop downstairs, but it's quite an expensive book, so you can just like, read it there or get, it, or get a library. If you have an academic library, ask them to order it because it's one of those sort of academic books. Um, but about, about ice in the, in the Russian Arctic in the 1930s and how it changes um, in a way, attitudes towards it change. And it's some of it, there's lots of different reasons and different aspects to it, but uh, it, it uh, kind of coalesces around the figure of the icebreaker, which uh, the nuclear icebreakers were being developed at that time. And, there, and uh, we also write about the Chelyuskin disaster. Um, it's quite interesting how disasters can be made into heroic successes. Um, 
Franklin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Franklin and Scott, <laughs> actually. Um, um, especially by the Brits. <laughs> I'm really good at that. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that was a sort of first, it was a kind of celebrity disaster. But then it was a success because they bring together two dif uh, several different technologies together, which then enable them to rescue everybody. So uh, not, it's not just one technology. There's radio and flight and landing on the ice and, and rescuing. So the Chiluskin was a, a non-icebreaker, non-ice glass vessel that sailed um, across the northern sea route. And the aim was for it to do it in one go, in one season, as in not like fram and float around. Um, and just didn't quite manage it. And the only reason they would, um, and it broke up, and, uh, and one person did die, although everybody always says that they were all rescued, but it's not true. <laughs> um, and but most of them were rescued. And there were people, they were going, actually it was a colonial exercise because they were going to populate some of the Arctic islands. And there, were, there was a pregnant woman on there and there were like families that were going to settle these really inhospitable, unpo unpopulated islands north of the um, mainland, the north of the continent. Um, and, and there was a lot of publicity around this. It was in 1933. Um, and then what was I going to say? Uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, yeah, the colonial... La la la, sorry, I've forgotten. Dear. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, the... Uh, yeah, there was, this, there was this accident and they were, and they were rescued. Um, oh, yes, the only reason why they attempted it was because there was a mini thaw in the 1930s in the Arctic. So there was a, not a thaw, but a mini warming. So it was actually warmer. So there wasn't that as much sea ice as there had been. And so there was this sense, and that fed into lots of um, Soviet uh, ideas of conquering, um, conquering nature, conquering ice through technology. But there's kind of interesting is that sometimes ice is this worthy foe, as in you know, for the for the Soviet man, for new Soviet man, especially man, um, though the women were going to go out there and have babies and populate it, of course. But it was, you know, it was still quite. It's still very much the myth. The myth around the Arctic is very masculine as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. So ice is sometimes this worthy foe. It's like you know, it breaks up ships and um, and. You know, we the the casting the icebreakers go and rescue Nobile, go and rescue other um, Arctic explorers who've um, come a cropper. But it sometimes it's also friendly because it allows people to sli sleep on the ice, live on the ice, have a, a weather station on the ice, put up a tent on the ice. Um, there are children's stories around the ice. Bodvig Valdach is like a really uh, famous children's story about. Um, well, not, I don't know how famous it is actually, but especially not now. But it was famous, and it was. <laughs> I don't know. Did you read Podvi Valdach? No. Uh, anyway, no, most people haven't read it actually. But um, you know, so there there was children's literature around it and around the sort of expert. So ice, so ice has got this kind of different plays these different sorts of roles um, at that time, uh, and and it's, but it's playing on these different kinds of mythologies. But it's interesting how. They are specific. They, they're kind of specific and universalized, or made to seem universal. But but Putin's I, um, icebreaker program for the last um, twelve years has been about building bigger and bigger icebreakers to conquer the Arctic. Meanwhile, there is less and less Arctic ice and less need for Arctic icebreakers. And I was at a, on a conference on an ice on an icebreaker on the Krasin, which is a museum in Saint Petersburg, but it's very early built in Newcastle. Um, <laughs> so along with Yermak and all sorts of icebreakers were built in, in, in Britain for the Tsars. And then later uh, they were renamed and for the, you know, for the Soviets. Um, but I was on this, uh, on in, a, in a conference about it and I said something, and they were, we were being shown around like the icebreaker and they're saying, no, and this is like we're building the big one in Sibir and blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, and there's less, and I, under my breath, I was like, yeah, and there's less and less sea ice. And then and then somebody threw the head around and said, no, it's cyclical climate. I said, and what about climate change? He said, no, it's cyclical. I mean, this is some years ago now. It's like five, six years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah. 
but it's yeah so yes mythologies um uh, yes they are adapted to suit the times as well <coughs> i didn't read this one but um you know i was in kindergarten already in post-soviet times and even then you know i was six years old or something and uh the uh conquering of the arctic was an important myth that felt you know exotic or romantic and you know fed even <coughs> to me as a, as a, as a little post-soviet boy which was very exciting <laughs> Maybe can mm -hmm. I just uh, add a little bit uh, because uh, I, I think it's like uh, Walter Mignola told uh, uh, there are many different stories, but uh, we should ask who tells the story and why do they tell the story, you know, because like, for example, uh, now um, I'm in Oslo and one of the grand narratives uh, here, at least for 100 years ago, was the story of Nansen, a fleet of Nansen and Ruel and Amundsen, both of them are not uh, Arctic, uh, they're not from the Arctic, they're from uh, like, uh, <laughs> they're from, they're from Oslo and they, uh, they're from this, uh, this area. Uh, and their stories, of course, they were also created and uh, like, like Ruel Amundsen taking pictures of himself and Oslo Fjord in winter and uh, using it for promotion of his Arctic travels, you know, so uh, who creates the myth and how it is, is it created? I think this is an important story and which voices are heard, uh, what voices are heard, are indigenous voices are heard, they become more and more relevant. Uh, and uh, those of you who maybe have seen the Sami Pavilion at the Venice Biennale have, um, yes, uh, one of the projects that uh, one of the projects that I found important during this trip was an article and research of Sergei Kulikov because he did his res uh, work on uh, architecture. Um, how do you call it? Um, it's a, it's a kind of architecture that disappears in nature, you know, like the small forms that you can find in the forests. Uh, a hunter hut, for example, you know, like uh, some indigenous uh, constructions made of wood or natural materials. They haven't ever been any subject of uh, research. And I think we did this step during this trip, actually. So I hope that it will be published in English as well. But yes, uh, all stories are told. Why are they told and who is telling the story? That's the point. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I think we have uh, time for, and maybe you can get both questions, and then and that will be it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have a question as such, but just uh, some ideas if we can uh, reflect on that. So Ekaterina, you talked about the local histories that is that was not known in the national histories that you were taught, uh, and. Also, we were talking about indigenous, the local traditions, uh, local myths. But now when we look at the, the melting of the Arctic, the warming up, and there is this whole geopolitical concept of Arctic that's emerging, uh, that's one thing. Uh, and then there is also the national, so from Moscow, there are the treatment of the region, including of, of this region, Arctic. So there are these, uh, I mean, is there a sense among the local people now uh, of being colonized or subjugated? And to what extent that sense is becoming more powerful or maybe that's becoming more muted now with the, this whole geopolitical idea of Arctic and coming and the foreign companies and businesses and everything that's, that's coming and just silencing the local voices uh, and I just recalled a couple of years ago when in Moscow they, they were they had this plan to send all the the waste to Arkhangelsk. Yeah, and, yeah. They, and they had big protests and they and, won. And they won. The and protests they didn't worked. It's, I, it was really an amazing story, actually, of, of a huge protest in Arkhangelsk and they won. And they voted out and they, 
They were fighting the dumping of nuclear waste in the White Sea next to Arhangelsk, and they won, and it wasn't dumped there. So um, that was really successful, and, they, and it was against the mayor who wanted to do it, and, and he was voted out. Yeah, I it was. You know the details, Katarina, but I was told about it when oh, I was there. Oh, yes. Well, I don't know about local identity. Well, but I think that uh, it's uh, this uh, uh, garbage. Uh, always emigrate. <laughs> you know? um, there is a big uh, text actually, which is published by the University of Bergen uh, here in Norway. Well, no, there aren't many children in the villages. Actually, hardly any. Um, sorry, but I was saying this is a, that was our Hangels, which is not a village. It's a town. It's a big city. I mean, quite a big city. It's not a huge city. Um, I mean. This is really a question that Yekaterina can answer better than I can. But I mean, the, geopoli the geopolitics right now are the war uh, as well. So, I mean, of course, that the, war, the geopolitics of the war are sidelining the Arctic. And there's, there was a letter to Nature written by Gareth, Re uh, Gareth Rees and others, um, who's a scientist working in the Kola Peninsula for you know decades, and saying we have to open up, we have to keep our scientific connections and keep contact with with Russian scientists in the Arctic because of climate change and it's really dangerous not to I mean there are things like logging in the in that region now they're not because of sanctions they're not going to be able to do FSC yeah and it's a foreign agent but also they won't be able to certify FSC timber therefore timber won't be FSC certified which means what's the point in doing kind of sustainable forestry if you can't sell it as sustain sustainable for uh, tree wood? So, you know, it's really important. Like, it's very difficult. We're balancing the, you know, I'm not saying we, I'm not balancing it, but, you know, these things have to be weighed up. It's like sanctions are clearly working in some way. Uh, they put pressure and, but, some sanctions can be counterproductive, but how do you pick which ones? And <laughs> do you do? I don't know how you do that. I'm I'm an artist, so, but um, uh, but we're going to take well, we're going to take one more question as well, and then maybe. Uh, well, actually, I have something to say as a comment to. Um, this builds actually nicely on the recent conversation, which is really you know for both of you actually, your interest in the Arctic has gone on for quite a long time. And we've been talking about kind of forests, but I, but I, I'm remembering that um, it was a few months ago. I mean, two or three months ago, where there were um, attempted launching of um, satellites in Shetland, and remember there was the cutting of the wires underground and suspicions it was Russian submarines, but no one ever kind of acknowledged anything. And um, and I'm aware that um, writers like Pippa Melgram has been saying. She was talking about this before Ukraine. I guess Ukraine up upends this a little bit. That some of the wars which are going on, connected, of course, to climate change, are for most of the population actually now happening either above the clouds, right up in satellite systems. But actually, she um, she was saying below the sea level with cables and all sorts of things going on as well. And um, and the way in which um, with the changing geopolitics, that imperial relationship to the melting, you know, ice and everything is actually really accelerating r right now, really accelerating. And so as well as all sorts of, you know, cuttings of wires that are going on surreptitiously, not even making the news, some of it apparently, um, but also I'm aware of increased tension at the Russian-Norwegian border, all sorts of other things are happening. So there is a sort of unacknowledged series of conflicts which are... We, we, we're not looking, you're right, at it because of what's going on in Ukraine, but it is happening. And so given you've got this ongoing interest, both of you, for, you know, um, I'm wondering whether any plans that you might have or thoughts for future work, because I think it's become an even hotter area right now, you know, and whether you recognise what Pippa Melgram is saying, that in a way, you know, above the sky and below the sea is where, uh, and in the Arctic especially, is where a lot of the kind of current war hotspots are happening already. Ingterin, do you want to share something? Well, actually, I had a comment on the previous one, but I don't know if you hear me or heard or not. Uh, no, we didn't, but we now we do. 
Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, about the previous uh, question, I think uh, uh, the story of Shias was very uh, one of the most important things uh, in the protests. Was uh, of course the uh, the threat to the nature, to the ecosystem, which uh, uh, has been vital to the local people in the in the area. And it was actually a governor. Uh, who was uh, initiated, all, uh, like he was one of those who put by Putin, he was not elected. And uh, my brother was, he's like in opposition to him, you know, now he's not a politician anymore, but still, uh, it's like very <laughs> vital uh, stuff. But culture was very important in those protests. So, people uh, who gathered in Shias, they said, like, we have never had slavery here in the North. Никогда не было крепостного права. We are, have a rich culture. And uh, this new attempt of colonization of the North has been, like, uh, of course, understood as the attempt of colonization. So, um, but I, I think that when I was trying to find a language when working with uh, meaning making or like production of meaning in the this art artistic research process, uh, I just realized that there was no only language, and I found out that the colonial um, studies um, done mostly in uh, India and in Latin America, and by Madina Tlastanova, who is very important researcher this language really could work to describe what happened with uh, like my generation the generation of my parents and maybe great grandparents because this loss of memory loss of history is uh, something which is very uh, particular for modernity but not only for this region many other different places around the world so definitely it's a colonial story and uh now, of course, it may be dangerous to talk about it, but all our work was about uh, returning the memory to ourselves and uh, empowering local people with a local with their own culture. Uh, yes, basically, I, I think uh, these stories are not told uh, yet, but. Uh, I hope that they will be uh, learned by more people. In the last Arctic Year book, uh, I wrote an article together with Maria Homarniemi from the University of Lapland, and I presented some other research uh, on Monday uh, uh, about this um, rediscovery of, uh, of their local identity. And uh, I really hope that it will be more known because there are stories of many people and uh, Russia is not only Moscow and St. Petersburg it's much more than that thank you can I say a couple of things the, 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 the language of colonialism is very much is very significant in the Canadian Arctic the American Arctic in the Norwegian Arctic currently there's a struggle going on between Sami and the Norwegian government and this the, the, so this way of looking at things is very much is, is very key to that. Of course, in the Russian Arctic and with other Russian ethnic minority populations in the war, and the extent to which there may be a disproportionate number of people being drafted, that is, of course, a huge issue uh, right now. Uh, on the question of, just to go to this geopolitical question, I want to turn it over to you, to go, to go, to go over to the geopolitical question. Um, I mean, obviously, you should read my book. Uh, uh, but um, but the the... I think you know th there have been a whole range of things which have happened recently. The the uh, the Commission President, European Commission President, Norwegian Prime Minister went to various energy infrastructure, offshore energy infrastructure. Um, I mean, dare I say it? I, I people used to think that there was going to be a war in the Arctic. My view was always that there was go if there was likely to be a conflict elsewhere, where the there would have ram there would be ramifications which would spill over into the Arctic. Uh, and I think that's th really the more the more the more likely threat. Um, in terms of future projects, you know, one thing we haven't spoken about here uh, is the way in which the Arctic Council is, which is the sort of the, the international organisation, quasi-international organisation, interstate organisation, has ceased to function effectively after the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, and of course, 
now Finland and Sweden will join NATO, and so the Arctic will be entirely Russia and NATO. So all of these things are, are coming together in a way which I think is very, um, it's very worrying, but it was predicted um, in this book. <laughs> Arctic Council worked really well until now. It's, I mean, it really was very effective. Um, really sad. That's a nice conclusion. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Let's but there's also great yeah. things. Yeah, no, what are they? Get, no, come on. <laughs> the film. Uh, yes. So we are out of time, uh, but uh, we, are, we will be still open for another half an hour, and my colleague and myself will bring the speakers downstairs and we'll switch uh, the film one last time. So those of you who haven't watched it yet, you'll have a chance to watch it. And thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, Ruth, Charles, and Ekaterina for this wonderful conversation. I think it's been a tremendous success. So I congratulate all of us with that. And thank you to Pushkin House. And thank you, Denise. Спасибо большое. Хорошего вечера. And to Anastasia over there, who's been doing the, all the tech. <laughs>